few weeks ago, like many of you, I was at a, a, um, a, the marking of 9-11, of the 17 years of 9-11 at the U.S. Institute of Peace with Nancy Lindborg. And we, it was a moment that was, um, that was giving an award to the, the co-chairs of the 9-11 Commission. And Governor Keene, one of the co-chairs, said there were three goals. Um, and two of them we got right and one we didn't. One was obviously to go after those that, that, weren't, that, that perpetrated the terrorist attack, and we did that pretty well in Afghanistan. The second was to make sure that we, we did what we needed to to get our intelligence coordinated, better coordinated, so we wouldn't be attacked. But the third we didn't do well enough, still 17 years later, and I'm reading from the report, to stop the next 9-11 attack, U.S. needs a new strategy to mitigate the conditions that enable extremism groups to take root, spread, and thrive, in other words, to prevent the growth of terrorism. So causes of conflict are not all about terrorism, but clearly that is a lot of what we're going to talk about today. Lucky for us, we have the panel of the gentleman to my left, your right. Ambassador Rick Barton, now at the Wood Woodrow Wilson School, his last role of an unbelievable career in government was as the U.S. Se Assistant Secretary of State for Conflict and Stabilization of Operations. Next to him is Ambassador Grant Harris, now CEO of Harris African Partners. His last role of a long career also in government was as the point person in the White House uh, with President Obama overseeing Africa. Next to, uh, next to him is Paul Stairs, Senior Fellow for Conflict Prevention at the Council of Foreign Relations. And far away, you look so far, uh, John, John MacArthur, uh, wearing two hats as the uh, Senior Fellow at the Brookings Institute and Senior Advisor of Sustainable Development at the UN Foundation. So gentlemen, welcome. Um, I'm going to try to go through a couple rounds. We'll see if we have time for questions from the audience. But I'm going to start on really trying to dig into this question of uh, causes of conflict. And Rick, I can't think of anyone better than to start with you, given that your entire uh, career in diplomat has been, been in some of the toughest places in the world. I think um, from everything I understand, 40 different countries you have worked in, places like Burma, Rwanda, Haiti, Afghanistan, Iraq, the list goes on. My goodness, uh, you have done it all. You set up and founded the director of, uh, were the director at USAID, the Office of Transition Initiatives, and then started this Office of Conflict and Stabilization, Stabilization Operations at, you, at the State Department. So start us off of, as you, there's no one, one country that is the same, but could you start us off with a, some common threads you have seen of what creates conflict instability in some of these state conflict zones that you've seen? Great, <clears throat> great, well thank you, and thanks to all of you for being here today. Thanks, Liz, it's always a pleasure to be with you. Um, your introduction was more generous than the last one I received where somebody said, and most of the places Rick worked are still very much at war. Uh, so uh, so I've, uh, you, can, you can discount what follows, um, but I, I really see it as a witch's brew. It's uh, with a mostly male coven that uh, is disrespectful of large parts of its own population. Um, so if you start with that kind of complex mix. I don't buy that it's economics or that it's politics. ...people of the place, first and foremost. We get, because many of us come from institutions or we come from official jobs, we're very inclined to relate to our counterparts. And if you really do the, the hard work, and we'll talk about it, I think, as we go on, of finding the people and creating the data around the people, um, you're going to be a much better informed person. And just as a, a quick rule of thumb, if the United States uh, required that we know 100 people well in every country that we send soldiers into, we probably would have avoided several of the most recent disasters. I want to come back to you on that one, uh, but let me ask, uh, you said one thing that I want to pick up on to ask Grant this question. I spent a lot of time in the political arena and I always come back to it's the economy, stupid. Um, and, and that 
seems to come up a lot when we talk about causes of conflict. So Grant, I think a lot about your work. And there's often these questions about is the economy, when there's not economic opportunity, is that a driver, is that the driver, especially in places where you've worked, where there's these huge youth bulges, particularly in Africa, when there are not as many economic opportunities. How much is that driving some of these conflict areas, particularly, again, in Africa? That's a great question. Thank you for having me. Thank you to the Pearson Institute, and congrats on the inaugural forum. In Africa, in, in many of the cases that I've seen, and maybe to paint the picture, as you said, because there is, uh, there's great demographic change underway. And though the continent is 1.2 billion people right now, by 2050, Africa will be one quarter of the world's population. And if you think about that from a, a conflict lens, about what will it take then to make sure that there's the, demographic, the democratic and economic growth that we would want to see? And to Rick's points, I, I think there is sort of an all of the above needed, but the economics are very important. Because the, uh, the median age right now is 19 years old, there are a lot of jobs that need to be created. Specifically, according to the IMF, 18 million jobs per year need to be created just to absorb the, this young population. Just to essentially maintain st the static unemployment levels right now, let alone to really achieve the economic growth we'd want to see. And that is a very tall order. And what recent surveys have shown, particularly in looking at Boko Haram in Nigeria and somewhat in Al-Shabaab and elsewhere, is that the economics are a driver toward extremism. One nonprofit estimated that for $600 you could lure someone into an extremist group in West Africa. Others have said that in terms of the survey results that religious ideology played a role in some cases, but that it was really the lack of jobs and economic hopelessness combined with a sense of injustice, and that's governance at its core. And that those factors together, that's the witch's brew, I think, that I saw most often in looking at Boko Haram uh, and, and other groups that were really attracting youth at an incredible rate, and we were trying to pinpoint why. Traditionally, I think we collectively put more emphasis on religious ideology than we should have. We need to think about the economics. We need to think about the justice, the rule of law. We need to think about that entire picture. All right, Paul, you're going to make this more complicated because a lot of, um, you and I talked last week, and uh, so much when we look at causes of conflict, we look country by country. But you said something to me that was really powerful, is that a lot of these conflict places, Burma, South Sudan, Syria, we could keep making the list, are really proxy wars. These are geopolitical, international issues, and we have to look at it in multi-dimensional, three-dimensional chess. So bring in the complexity. Causes of conflict are not just country by country. They're happening at the international level, and we have to look at it in that way as well. Paul. Absolutely. Let me also add my uh, thanks to the organizers of this uh, forum, just a terrific opportunity to, to come out to Chicago and talk to a lot of really smart people. So yes, Liz, you're right. Um, the witch's brew, to use Rick's term, is, is actually getting even worse and more dangerous. And, and it's really because of this trend that we've been seeing since uh, the early part of the century, the increasing internationalization of conflict, of civil conflict in particular. And by that, I mean uh, the, the uh, involvement of outside powers um, directly or indirectly through proxy forces. In the mid-90s, around 5% of all civil wars were internationalized. Depending on how you count it, they're now about 25 to 30% are internationalized. Why is this uh, something to worry about? Firstly, internationalized civil conflicts tend to be the most dangerous, the most vicious kinds. 80% of all combat deaths currently uh, over the last year in civil conflicts were on internationalized conflicts. Mm -hmm. Secondly, they last longer. The average duration of a civil conflict used to be around seven, eight years. It's now more like 10, 12 years. So if you think of Syria that began in what, 2010, 2011, we've still got a few years to go by the, this calendar. And thirdly, they're harder to resolve because there's many more players. It's essentially a two-level two game. There's the local actors and then there's these higher-level actors. And so uh, this is making the, the landscape of uh, conflict analysis and conflict resolution so much harder. And frankly, as the larger sort of geopolitical climate worsens, uh, great power rivalry here about all time, this is just going to make things a lot worse. So uh, we're going to keep talking about causes of conflict, but I 
and I know the afternoon sessions are going to look at what do we do with solutions, but I can't have all of you up here and not make sure I ask about solutions. So, John, I'm going to start to move into a little bit of solutions. You, you spent a lot of time on the multilateral system, particularly the UN. And I just came back, a lot of us were at the at UNGA, the UN General Assembly, and the conflict in fragile states was a big topic there. The UN Secretary General put the, put, called on the private sector to, to invest in, in this arena, made it a priority. What do you see in terms of the UN multilateral development banks? Where, where is the conversation going around the role of the multilateral system when it comes to fragility, when it comes to conflict? What are they doing that's working or not working? It's a great question, thank you. And just to echo the thanks to our hosts, I think uh, the UN is going through a period of reform. Uh, it's actually a very multi-layered answer because some people think, oh, multilateralism isn't working right now. But one of the interesting things is that the UN has just gone through a reform process. Uh, one can argue over whether it's uh, effective or not. But the Secretary General came to office with really a single tagline of uh, prevention. And the reforms include management reforms. They include uh, merging uh, the political affairs and peacekeeping operations, where there was a bit of a false divide, many would argue, beforehand. Uh, so the countries that were focused, or the staff that were focused on peacekeeping, uh, you know, were divided uh, from those focused on the politics that's being brought together. And crucially, the, uh, there's a merger of those that are focused on politics and development. So the UN development system is reformed, and even the way the UN will organize itself in each country is different with the idea is more political freedom. Now, this will all take effect January 1st, so the answer is we'll see. Uh, but there's also a lot of operational uh, cooperation with the World Bank uh, that is, I think, very positive, but again, we'll see. And getting to uh, the points that Paul just made, you know, the UN is only as good as its member states. If uh, the great powers are arguing or can't agree on anything, then we'll have problems. The, the countries with the top five number of uh, violent casualties don't have peacekeeping operations right now because great powers can't agree. So there is uh, a lot of layers. The final thing I'd say just to start is there's, of course, a discussion, well, what does prevention mean? And I think there's obviously the point on uh, what I call the guns and bombs questions of how to stop those being taken up. But the sustainable development goals are the global agreed economic, social, environmental objectives, and uh, therefore all countries. So there's an extreme poverty bit. Uh, there's also an inclusive society bit. And uh, crucially, we're seeing more and more of the conflict uh, linked to climate, I would argue. There's arguments about Syria, for, uh, role of drought there, but there's certainly a lot of evidence in Ted Miguel and Solomon Shang and so forth around the role of uh, climate in conflict, even globally. And we're seeing, uh, I think, an increase in the need to not just think in the near term, but in the long term around how inclusive society strategies can be promoted, at least by the UN and uh, the other multilaterals to uh, take a, a slightly wider aperture on how we think about prevention. So let me pick up on your inclusive society and go back, Rick, to, to you. So I brought a copy of your most recent book. Maybe it may be your only book. but um, for, So here's the title, if you haven't seen it. Peace Works. So you're an optimist. Um, Americans' unifying role in a turbulent world. And I told Rick I, I actually got through about half of it um, in my plane ride. It was a little delayed from coming in from D.C. And what is, if you haven't read it, I, I read it because... And I want you to comment on this part of it. it the chapters, like one of them is called Rwanda, Syria, Afghanistan. And they're these heartbreaking stories of your arrivals. And, and they're just, they're painful to read. But you end with lessons learned. And it, it picks up on John's point. And your lessons learned all go back to what you said at the beginning. If we only knew 100 people, local, 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 get to know these local voices. So go back to causes and now solutions. What is it about getting to know the local community and the local leaders that you think are the lessons to conflict, to solving conflict? Well, thank you. I mean, I, I was advantaged early on when I uh, was at AID that the AID did not have a deep uh, experience in conflict countries and didn't have much of an ambition to work there either. Uh, there were not that many employees who said, send me to a terrible place on earth. 
And so it was a, a rel relatively uncharted area. And I had the advantage of having worked in business in Maine and in politics. And when I didn't know something, which was most of the time, because I'd been pretty young uh, during those years, I had a very simple model, which was to just go out and talk to as many people as I possibly could. I then ran into a guy named Bob Gersoni, who is really the, the premier American field researcher of the last three decades. He's done 55 exhaustive studies on the ground in places where the data stinks and the stories are rumor filled. And he would, and he won't do, he won't take a job if you don't give him at least three months and you promise that you'll sit for at least a six hour or however many hour briefing when he gets home. If you're the Secretary of State, you have to sit there and listen to him if you have commissioned him to figure out what's going on in one of these places. So, and he has a, and he has a very simple rule. Talk to enough people in an, in an exhaustive way that it is completely replicable. Now, data that is not replicable is not good data by rule. And he will go out there, and people will doubt the, his conclusion that after the, after the Rwanda genocide, there were tens of thousands of killings by the people, by the Tutsis, when they won the war. That is not a conclusion that the Tutsis wanted to have publicized to the world. It was a report that was buried in the UN. In my boss, Sadako, got this closet, basically, for years. It's now on the internet. But his methodology was so exhaustive. And it was, again, completely grounded in talking to the people. And the people are always there. And, I'm, and when I say no 100 people, it doesn't mean no 15 at the Ministry of Finance. That counts, but not really as deeply as if you've really gotten to 25 different places. So I don't know if that quite answers your so question. It's, so it's a, it's a local compact of making sure they're involved. Yeah. The, fir the, the first cardinal sin of most of us is that we think we know the place much better than we do. And it's obvious that we don't. Take the Israelis in the Gaza Strip. Every conceivable advantage. Real estate the size of this room, they had run the place, and they have the most sophisticated intelligence in the world. They go into the place, and what happens? Surprise after surprise. Now, put yourself, put the Americans in Afghanistan. 17 years later, we obviously, and many people now in their third and fourth tours, some, some of them going back to the same places, but they don't have the knowledge to lead to an immodest conclusion. Uh, and so modesty, humility, but the rigor of doing, of really listening to people, because you will always find out how dispossessed they are, how disrespected they are, and what their most simple ambitions are, because they do have those, otherwise they would have run or died by this point. So uh, I'm gonna stick with my book theme, but I didn't bring a copy, Paul, so I'm sorry. But you wrote one which I think plays on some similar themes of preventative partnerships and a tool of how America can avoid war. So who are these partners, and is it similar to what, what Rick's talking about, which is causes of conflict is we're not engaging with people. Well, I, Rick was smarter than I. I should have slipped you a copy of my book I, I, uh, I, I, for I the plane ride, Amazon. too. So, <laughs> um, it's available so, um, Both of them. <laughs> yeah, we, you know, the, 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 the logical implication of everything we're talking about here is that we have to go upstream to, to deal with these these sources of conflict, that we can't let them deteriorate and face all these other challenges. But what is going upstream to do to early conflict prevention, risk reduction, there's all kinds of terms. You know, what does that actually uh, entail? And, and it's amazing that all the times we've invoked this need, we, we've never developed a, a real kind of preventive doctrine or a, a, a systematic, rigorous, policy framework for doing this. And there are many things involved in, in preventive action, and there are many partners that one can, can involve from you know, the multilateral, bilateral, alliance relationships, regional organizations, right down to local NGOs and churches and foundations. There's a huge number here that, that can be uh, mobilized and leveraged. They all bring something to the table. But you have to have this overarching 
uh, conception of what you're trying to do. And un unless you really have that, you're just throwing you know, spaghetti at the wall and hoping it sticks. And so you, you really have to think about it. And I tried to do this in my book, to actually provide a comprehensive framework where everybody can say, oh yeah, this is where I fit in here. And so it's you know, upstream risk reduction, it's dealing with um, uh, fragile states before they start to deteriorate. Uh, there's more, you know, being able to identify when countries are on the, on the risk of, uh, the cuffs rather, of slipping into conflict. And there's a whole menu of measures that one can take then. And then dealing it when things start to unravel. At each stage, you know, you, you can look at it like a multi-level campaign. There are th interventions that you can do, but no one really has a clear idea of what's available. So we when we get round the, the table, and, and Grant knows this from being at the, the top table in the US government, choices tend to uh, devolve to binary choices of either doing, doing a lot or nothing. And the lot seems very intimidating, and so we end up doing nothing. The problem gets worse, and this is what we've seen in so many places. So that's, uh, I want to open it up to a few minutes of questions, but let me ask one more to Grant and to John. And it picks up on doing something, nothing. Um, so it's a similar question to both of you. In the last year, we've seen in, on the U.S. side, but it's also happened around the world. <clears throat> so I'm going to ask Grant the U.S. side and John the around the world question. We've seen some pretty dramatic proposals to cut what we're doing in terms of the, uh, our international development and diplomacy programs. So in the U.S., we saw proposals of the U.S. government to cut literally 30% of our development and diplomacy programs. Now, Congress said, no, we're not going to do that. But it could have had some real impact on our health programs, our education programs, our economic development programs, our stabilization programs. And so, Grant, my question to you is, are these poverty reduction programs, are they, you know, do they make a difference? What would that have, would, would, would that have made a difference? And John, we're seeing some of the donor countries having battles internally that have been the leaders in the world. We're seeing the battle going on at the UK, in Canada, in Denmark. And, and, and so what are the ramifications that, as we even learn what's working to respond, we're seeing real international conversations about pulling back. So Grant, and then John, and then I am going to open it up for a few questions that we can have time to take. Sure. An another big question that's hard to digest in this amount of time. Minutes, but. Right. It won't surprise you or anyone in the audience to give my personal view that retrenching and pulling back this type of outreach and engagement and assistance would be wrong-headed. And fortunately, Congress did step in, but I think the rationale is pretty clear. We're talking about America's role in the world to be clear, of course, but we're also in a public policy environment, and we need to think about what then is driving our desire to reduce conflict, and it's, it's for stability. It's for our own stability. It's for our own uh, national interests as well. There is a humanitarian side to a lot of our work. There are other rationales as well. But even for those with a very narrow lens worried about only counterterrorism or only what they would consider uh, a very discreet set of national interests, it still makes sense through that lens because when you don't have job creation or economic growth, when you don't have health, when you don't have governance, when you don't have rule of law, that fosters instability. And I mentioned, of course, when you've got large populations of disaffected youth, that can be a highly volatile mix. But you've also then got, it feeds into regional conflicts, it feeds into then proxy wars, it, it feeds into the whole panoramic uh, display of threats. And so I think at its core, we need to think about how we see ourselves as a country. We need to think about our role, our values, and our principles. And even as we're making the case to, I think, what is a very wrong-headed approach of just this limited set of issues, there again, we need to be engaged. We need to be pursuing these types of programs. We need to have these relationships. Because if we don't, there are other players in the world that certainly will. And whether it's China or any other country that is engaging, for instance, African states, they are not engaging with the same interests about transparency or environmental considerations for their investments or the social considerations of their debt uh, or anything that they're doing or who they're selling arms to, whether it's a Sudanese government and they're ending up in Darfur and the like. We need to be thinking about our foreign policy holistically, and a big piece of that is what we're doing with respect to health, what we're doing with respect to assistance, what we are doing with respect to promoting American investment and helping U.S. companies work and operate and be successful abroad.
John? Well, I'm Canadian, so I'm delighted <laughs> you mentioned. Thank you. But um, I think it, a lot of it comes down to two schools of thought that need to merge their thinking. One is the school of global affairs, which is the classic kind of foreign policy community, which is uh, you know a lot of the military defense stuff. And then there's a school of thought, which is around uh, you know quality of life, promoting uh, well-being around the world. Uh, one of the things we've seen is that people and many military leaders even will make the case these days that you know if you don't deal with the quality of life issues and the inclusive society issues, you're going to have to deploy a lot more troops. We spend, of course, vastly more resources on uh, the troop side of life. But the bigger issue, I think, is we're not terribly rational about the strategies. And uh, even in Canada, where I follow closely, uh, many people don't wouldn't realize uh, the Harper conservative government uh, was investing uh, more than the Trudeau government on these issues. The Trudeau government actually made a big boost in its investment in uh, defense spending last year. Uh, the same increment would have got the country to 0.7%, the international standard, uh, if it was on the development side. There's a logic of that being the highest return on investment, which might or might not be the case, but I think if one were to say, what's the value of each dollar, one could think differently. The other thing I'd say quickly is, uh, this notion of kind of societal scorecards is increasingly how I'm looking at the uh, sustainable development goals. We, to, in a way, I never expected to, because there's one side of it, which is how's your society doing uh, on an absolute basis. But I use the analogy of if you're driving in a car on a road trip, you know, moment to moment, you care about how fast you're going compared to the car next to you, not necessarily how many minutes you are from your destination. And what we can see in many of these issues, including the health ones actually, is even the most fragile states are making progress. Uh, child mortality is coming down two to 3% a year in even the most fragile states right now. This is extraordinary success. But what we also see is place, the problems of extreme poverty are certainly becoming concentrated in, around the Sahel and Nigeria in particular. Uh, we have issues of child mortality, maternal mortality. Nigeria is again the number one country in the world for those issues. And if we don't have an answer to those issues, we're not going to have an answer to the security issues. And this is where I think a place like uh, this forum and the University of Chicago and the Pearson Institute can help to kind of reframe what's the debate we need to have. And, and I would argue that we need to be thinking much more about even the basic livelihoods of irrigation. So one of the great investments for mitigating farm risk and strains between uh, pastoralists and uh, agriculturalists and so forth is ir small scale irrigation. We don't have any, in my experience, serious conversation about that. And I've seen multiple instances in the Sahel where the first time water gets discussed is when it's for water for the troops. Mm -hmm. and, and so this is actually, it's, you know, it's a caricature, but I think it's a deeper problem we need to be thinking through. Terrific. All right, we're going to take, why don't we take uh, maybe three questions, and gentlemen, you can pick and choose how you want to respond. Um, but we have a time for, um, are we bringing microphones to people? Yes. Okay, so raise your hand. Um, not speeches. If you can ask quick questions, introduce yourself, and we'll get some help out there. Who's first? Question right here, please. Hi, I'm Ellie. I'm a... Paris student, formerly with the Locust Coalition FHI 360's crisis response team. Great. Considering that we have a new development finance corporation here in the U.S. as of this week uh, because of the BUILD Act, how might we structure that new agency in order to support conflict prevention and local ownership? Terrific. Great question. The BUILD Act is a new, we're going to have a new uh, OPIC, a new development finance uh, to try to keep up with the rest of the world. Um, we have a question over here. I'm sorry, <laughs> you have to run over here. Thanks, Ellie. Hi. Um, I think if you talk, it'll start to come on. Okay, thanks. Uh, I'm Sharon Riggle. I'm with the, the United Nations Special Representative's Office for Children in Armed Conflict. Uh, and a lot of these things uh, that we've heard this morning have really resonated with what we're, what we're seeing and hearing. And I wanted to pick up on a comment uh, that one of the one of our, the colleagues made on the on the stage about the pathways in and out for some of these children uh, into violent extremism because we're talking about conflict but we're also talking new type of conflict we're talking about protracted conflicts we're talking about international as was mentioned but we're also talking about ones that have uh, violent extremist elements uh, to it as well which has a very very political 
uh, L, uh, undertone. We, uh, anyways, I wanted to just draw attention. This is a, a university setting. Um, I was part of a, uh, a study, UN University studied, uh, called Cradled. Uh, it was a document produced called Cradled by Conflict. It's fantastic uh, information for those of you interested on pathways in and out for some of these children and how ideology is not uh, the right. primary driver, sometimes economics, but that's low down on the list as well. It's social relations, they join for pro-social reasons. Um, this is, I'm talking children right. versus adults, but it's also very interesting information I draw your attention to. It also implicates the, the adults as well. So Thank I wouldn't you. mind hearing more from any of the panelists on uh, some of the violent extremist issues. Thank you. Um, let's take one more. Please. Good morning, thank you. My name is Juliana Betancourt. I'm a master's student in Harris School of Public Policy, and I'm from Colombia, and my question is related with income generation opportunities for ex-combatants. Uh, one of the biggest problems that we have right now is to involve different stakeholders within our peace process, especially the private sector. So my question is, with, what will you recommend to involve, like, uh, not only, you know, the international cooperation, UN agencies, but also uh, with a blended finance approach to our peace process, especially the ongoing one with the former FARC members. Terrific. Thank you. Great, great different questions. So also, I think, Grant, uh, you, I know you want to talk about the private sector as well, right. in addition. Do you want to talk about um, uh, the, the question from over here? Um, yeah, I think, that I, yeah, right I, think I mean, the, I've always been a, a fan of, of sort of how important culture is and sort of the social environment. There are people who say of, of American institutions that culture eats strategy for lunch or whatever it happens to be. And, and so I'm, I'm very drawn to ways of reaching people directly through trying to avoid as many filters as possible and, and spent a lot of time really going back to the to uh, experiences in the Bosnian war on using media because media is one way that you can bypass a whole lot of, of filters or or managers of it and the, our, my last experience in Nigeria in particular we realized in, in a in a highly complex society of 165 million people whatever where you only have five or ten million dollars and you and you want to address a national narrative that violence pays kind of a problem what can you do well it turns out that nigeria has every form of media that exists anywhere in the world nigeria's got talent nigeria's got survivor nigeria's got every one of these things and we we partner with nollywood there which is the largest film industry in Africa, and it actually reaches all the way to Pakistan. And, we've, and we partnered with the Steven Spielberg of Nollywood, who is superstar director Jetta Amata. And that's, his, I mean, that's what everybody calls him. He doesn't get introduced as Jetta Amata. It's always superstar director. Um, and he was a phenomenal uh, contact and connection to the younger people of that country. Again, a very young country. And we, when you, when you end up doing something of real quality, you suddenly are able to reach as close to 160 million people as anybody in the country has, um, in, in a country that had, uh, that's had social protest movements and everything else going on. So I've, I, the socialization uh, issues that you mentioned are, to me are terribly important, but, you've got to, but you have to get around the usual blockages. Um, Paul, do you want to pick up on the, the question? <clears throat> I, I'm not sure I'm, I'm the best qualified to talk about it, but the, it's, it's clear that there are places, many places like Colombia, that are going through a period of transition. They're either coming out of conflict or going in, and, and uh, unless we think about how to uh, engage the communities, find jobs for people, reintegrate fighters back into society, deal with trauma, and this is done in a sustained fashion, then, you know, it's, we're just setting it up for a repeat uh, process. And I think this, this audience knows how vulnerable these kinds of societies are to regressing back into to violent conflict, having experienced it. And so uh, we've got to do a lot more work in, in thinking about how we can manage this problem 
with societies that have limited resources and where there's donor fatigue and uh, all this and other places that require a lot more effort and where it's easy just to turn your back on these places because they're coming out of conflict and it's like, well, done and dusted, we, we move on to the next one. And so it, it's, it, I'm not sure I have a, an easy... Yeah, we, don't, we don't have a lot of staying yeah. power. Um, uh, Grant, uh, private sector, where do they fit in? And both of you may want to talk about that we now have more capacity on development finance and what does that mean for the U.S.? I think the private sector has to be a crucial part. And of course, we've talked a little bit about the causes of radicalization. It's complex, it varies, it depends, but I do think jobs and economics are a piece of that. Uh, governance and other issues as well, very much so. But to the development finance and the role of private sector and how we can support it, that is key. But by way of background, many people are probably aware that Congress just passed the BUILD Act, as the questioner referenced. This is going to double the size of the Overseas Private Investment Corporation and incorporate a piece of the U.S. Agency for International Development. And long story short, it'll be about $60 billion of capacity in a new development finance institution. This is fantastic. It's great. It's long overdue. It's also necessary but not sufficient. And what the United States and other countries should be doing, all the more so, is commercial advocacy, more political risk insurance, more financing options, and really amp up the amount of support so that, uh, that investment climates are, are more attractive uh, from the private sector side in terms of supporting companies for making the investment. And then from the governance side, I think that the private sector is a, a way to get at this conversation because each government wants to attract more investment, but then when you start talking about a government, what will it take to do that? You need an investment climate, what does that take? It takes sanctity of contract, rule of law, all of these same things that go to the heart of governance and that would also be solutions to many of these issues. So it's a two-sided coin, and I think we just can't talk about the private sector enough in making sure that we're it's really about attracting security, them. they're not going. That's right. Um, John, do you want to add anything to, to this part of the conversation? Yeah, just two quick things. One is on the private sector. When I talk about irrigation, just to be clear, that's agriculture, which in the low-income places is the is, private is the sector. the economy, right. Yeah. And this is part of the, again, we need to reconcile this in our minds. And I would also say, you know, in the deeper economics jargon of capital widening versus capital deepening, when you have these big demographic uh, bulges, you know, there's no capital deepening. And one of the big, big things we're also not paying attention to, if you could ask me for a magic wand, uh, would be massive investments in girls' secondary education. And this is kind of the apple pie of the global system. We're just not doing it. And there's a lot of deep reasons why that would be transformational. The other thing I'd just quickly say on the society bit, we just published a paper looking at trajectories on a bunch of uh, people-focused issues around the world. Yeah, in rough, rough math, and there's people in the room who know much more than me, but in rough math, you know, there are about four times as many uh, violent homicides per year as there are conflict-affected casualties, about 400,000 versus 100,000. There is a, is a sustainable development goal for homicides. One of the things we looked at is if you were to, uh, you know, see who's on track to cut it by half, who's not, two-thirds of the world's lives at stake are in just five countries. And this is Brazil, Mexico, Pakistan, Venezuela, and India. It's about a million and a half lives. And what does that mean for the fragility of those societies? I think we have to be thinking much more systematically, again, about the longer term sources of fragility and what conflict means and where it might erupt, even on a pure social contract basis. All right, this is the closing lightning round. And here's the question I want to ask each of you. You get about 30, 40 seconds to answer. But one of the things that I think about the, um, the, the Pearson Global Forum is I know they don't want this just to be a lot of talking heads, but to make a difference. And if I were to ask us all to think about, not just coming back a year from now, but if we came back five years from now and said, you know what, that panel we got to join on, it made a difference. And one of the ways it's gonna make a difference is if we give back to the academics, the researchers that are here and say, here's your big bet. Here's where you can invest in. Here's the research when it comes to causes of conflict that there's still a hole. Or, I know what we should be investing in, and here's the one to invest in. Where would you make your big bet? Where would you say this is the cause of conflict to invest in? Because we've talked about a lot of different ones. John, where's your big bet? Well, I just said my two, I guess. All it's right. uh, agricultural credit for uh, irrigation in particular, 
uh, and then girls secondary education. Okay, Paul, where's yours? Mine would be, how can we get to $5,000 per capita GDP? Because beyond that threshold, there's almost no country that goes into violent civil conflict. And when we are now confronted with alternative uh, economic models of growth, the Chinese model, how can we uh, promote countries to get to above that threshold without necessarily compromising on our de democratic and human rights principles? Okay, the master's and PhD students, there's your, your next one. <laughs> All right, Grant? I, I feel like a broken record, but I do think jobs and economic growth is key. And I think teeing off of Paul's point, infrastructure and just the basic investments that are necessary and the private sector support that it will take. In Africa, there's a $50 billion a year gap in the spending that is needed to promote and increase infrastructure. And we're talking about access to power. We're talking about roads. We're talking about the backbone of what could be significant economic growth. And that is going to take private sector investment. It won't be public sector spending that does it. And I would just encourage those in the room who are students to be thinking about private sector experience and to be thinking about how capital moves and what investment climates look like so that we can be having this be a key part of the conversation. I found in government that there was, there was not enough knowledge and information and comfort with those issues, and I think that that will limit us over time. Fantastic. Rick? So I, I would uh, encourage <clears throat> direct, iterative field research. Uh, so people who actually get out and create the data don't count on the World Bank, don't count on the, uh, these other institutions. That data is flawed, and it's not going <clears> to <throat> it's not going to lead to good conclusions. Um, and then the second thing I would say is that uh, really put an emphasis on what I consider silenced the majorities. That in almost every country, if you start really looking at what's happening to women, to young people, even the business community, they they they're silenced for different reasons, but they all have probably more constructive views of the future than many of the leaders that we, that we uh, end up have developing key relationships with. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in thanking these gentlemen for what they've done and what they just did.